Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is January 28th, 2015, and let's get straight into our news tonight. World government, global government, the NWO, something that people say doesn't exist, even though you can go on YouTube and type in montages of New World Order or global government and see a plethora, as Paul Joseph Watson would say, of politicians using these very phrases. And now we see one William Gates using the same type of vernacular as well. Bill Gates calls for global government. Billionaire Bill Gates has called for a kind of global government this week, arguing that the creation of such a system would be needed to combat major issues such as climate change. Gates went on to stress his position further, stating that a global government was badly needed in order to combat an array of issues ailing the planet. And this is the same Bill Gates who says we need to reduce our world population. How? By the use of vaccines. And it just so happens Bill Gates is a major pusher of the polio vaccine that just so happens to cripple about 50,000 children. A, a recent study back in 2012 found out. So this is what these guys are up to, you know, whether it's Reagan or Bush or Obama talking about global government or world order, whatever the phrase may be. Yes, this does exist or, you know, at least in the cards. And people say, well, what exactly is the NWO? Is it fully formed? I can't say that it fully is, but I'm saying this is what they want. It's not me saying this is what's happened. This is what they want. They want a world government, a new world order, whatever you choose to call it uh, by that particular politician or government head. So we'll bring you more on that as these stories develop. Now let's switch gears now and talk about some war. We go from global government to war. Israel and Hezbollah prepare for war. Israel has vowed a disproportionate response after two IDF soldiers were killed and seven wounded by an anti-tank missile fired by Hezbollah near the Hardav area near the Lebanon border. The apparent attack follows the killing of Iran's Revolutionary Guard General during an Israeli airstrike on the Golem Heights area of Syria. The January 18th attack also killed six members of Hezbollah. So we see uh, tension starting to mount. And we'll bring you the latest on this as it continues to develop. There are many, many things going on. We see situations in Syria, other places as well. So we'll see uh, who's the first to flinch on this one, and hopefully uh, the cooler heads will prevail. And we see a lot of tension, uh, not just online, but you go to any aspect of social media, you know, there's a lot of Charlie Hebdo backlash, fallout, whatever you want to call it. And now we see Facebook censoring people. Now, this is the same Facebook that will put guns in the same category as porn, many other questionable activities as well. But now if you post an image of Muhammad, it doesn't have to be a derogatory image like we saw at Charlie Hebdo. But if you place any image on Facebook, you will be censored. Responding to a request by, a government, by the government of Turkey, social media giant Facebook is now censoring images of the Muslim prophet Muhammad. So like I said, I mean, you can put many other derogatory things on there. Uh, last week, I, Leanne McAdoo interviewed somebody who said that there were people on Facebook calling for her death. You know, whatever anonymous posters, users were calling for her death. And that was fine with Facebook. That said, they said they did not violate their policy. But now, uh, if you want to put up an image of Muhammad, not even a derogatory one, you will be censored. So, you know, you can use Facebook for various things. We use it to get the message out about our media outlet. But, you know, just be careful of the stuff you put on there and understand that they don't have your best interest at heart. It's just basically a big hub. You know, we saw them alleged in the uh, PRISM scandal, many other places as well. So you got to watch what you put on there. Now, let's talk about some, when we talk about guns on Facebook, let's just talk about guns in general. There's a lot of gun misconceptions going on in the United States. And this is a great video to point those out. Shooting down statistical violence aimed at U.S. gun owners. Of the 218 nations and territories listed for per capita murders, the United States of America, Murderville, USA, did not break the top 100. We are, with 4.7 murders per 100,000 people in 2012, number 111. And virtually all, if not all, of those nations ranked higher than us are big state socialist utopias with stringent gun control laws. How tragically disappointing that must be for our moral superiors. And I do encourage you to go to InfoWars.com and watch that full video. It's very good. It talks about all the facts and figures that a lot of these anti-gunners just don't want to talk about. And the part in there where the guy was talking about how we rank in the murder capitals, we're not even in the top 100. And yes, you hear a lot about these things uh, we talked about last week the FBI crime statistics, which pretty much were down across the board. There was an increase in rape, but all other violent crimes were down. And, you know, it just goes to show that it's not the gun that, you know, when we talk about the rape went up, it's not the gun that's raping these people. It's the evil people who do these actions. The gun itself is not inherently evil. So that's just food for thought. And let's continue with these guns are not inherently evil because the story that you probably didn't hear about because it happened at the same time as the Trayvon Martin shooting was this of Marissa Alexander, 
And she's a wife who faced 20 years for firing a warning shot to scare off an abusive husband. And she is finally out of jail. She has been in there for a while. Her original 2012 sentence has been a highlight and an example of the unfairness of Florida's stand-your-ground law. The original verdict was thrown out after the judge ruled that the court had incorrectly, incorrectly required Alexander to prove that she was abused by her husband. And if memory does serve, he did admit to some uh, shady doings. I can't go as far as to say exactly what those were, but he did say he had, or he admitted to doing some things and he recanted his statements there afterwards. So I'm very happy to see this lady out of jail. And I believe it was last year I did a report about how warning shots can land you in prison. Just as happened to this uh, poor individual, but luckily she's out. You guys remember the Joe Biden defense. He says, hey, if somebody comes to your house, they look for a problem, go out there and shoot two shotgun shells off your balcony and scare them off. And then uh, Project Veritas, <laughs> they run around to police stations, sheriff stations, and they asked, if I shoot my shotgun off my roof or off my balcony, like Joe Biden said, why go to jail? And they said, yes, sir, you will go to jail. Do not do the Joe Biden defense. If somebody breaks into your house, shoot them. Even if you shoot them in the leg, shoot them. All right, and we'll go to this one now. A city council member. You know, you guys recall this. Uh, before we go to that article, let me come back here. You guys recall last year, a gentleman went to a city council meeting, and he was an armed veteran. He said, hey, I served my country. I was trained in firearms. And they said, well, one of the council members jumped up. He said, I don't want you here in this council meeting. And then the council member then proceeded to leave the meeting because he didn't like the fact that the gentleman was there. But now we have the opposite of that case. This is in a different area. Councilman pulls out gun when gunman opens fire outside. Resolution authorizing the purchase of an electronic read report sign. Get down, get down. Everybody get down. That went right through the door. Get down, everyone get down. Somebody got shot. Stay down. If this is being taped, go to, go to commercial. Go away from this. And shots were fired outside the city council chamber. Luckily, the perpetrator did not walk into the chamber, but had he, the uh, city councilman was ready to defend himself and others. So it just goes to show, and this isn't a knock on the police, but the police were busy dealing with the outside threat, the men outside the council chamber. So if something happened inside the chamber, the people there would have been uh, out of luck, so to speak. But luckily, the man was there to protect himself. And finally, we'll end tonight with this. We see all type of threats, cyber threats, uh, physical threats. But what about a threat in your own home that you really don't have anything to do with? Water is black and stinks in Southern California community. Okay. Whoa. Black water comes out of my faucet, shower, bathtub. Marita collected some of it in this jar. The chunky, oily looking sediment in her drinking water is anything but appetizing. The water meets all drinking water standards, so it should be considered safe to drink. Other residents are also concerned. They say the water turns black intermittently without warning, and they say no one has tested to see if it's dangerous. The water's black and this smells. Ooh. And to the people of Gardena, I challenge all of you guys to get a big jug of this water. They say it's an isolated incident, so fill up your jug. It may not be black anymore, but go to your city council meeting, go talk to your mayor, talk to your congressman, talk to your senator, and challenge them. Say, hey, if you think this water is clean, you drink this water as it is, and then see them, see their faces when they decide not to drink it. But in the meantime, what you should do, go to the InfoWars shop and get a ProPure system. You know, it's some nasty stuff in the water, as we just saw. For a limited time, you can get free shipping on a ProPure water system. Now stay tuned because after this break, Rob Dew will give us the inside scoop on the NFL. And also I'll talk to Callan Diggs, who warns you about the potential pitfalls of going to college. Stay tuned. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. The knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. 
Every year we make resolutions to lose weight and get in shape. And the truth is it's hard, even with diet and exercise, because of toxic food in our environment that is stressing our bodies more than ever before. Working with experts in nutrition and biochemistry, I found that super high quality nutraceuticals, in addition to my diet and exercise, were the answers that synergistically worked. I can see the drastic changes every day with the amount of weight I've lost, my increased stamina, and more of a twinkle in my eye. That's why we are now so excited to launch the InfoWars Life Resolution Pack, combining three essential formulations, oxygen-based cleanser Oxy Powder, the Secret 12 Bioavailable Vitamin B12, and your choice of super female or super male vitality. Now all available at a discounted price to you and your family to bring in the new year and make 2015 a true success. That's InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. 2015 is the year to do it, and it all starts at InfoWarsLife.com. Hey guys, Rob Dew here, and unless you've been living under a rock and not aware of what's going on and you stay out of the mainstream media, you're not aware that the Super Bowl is going to happen. You're unlike those hundreds of millions of people that are going to spend countless hours and, and dollars and betting on all the different aspects of the game, who's going to win the coin toss, what color uniform is so-and-so going to wear, uh, is somebody going to have pink hand gloves on, who knows, there's a million things you can bet on out there, and uh, let me tell you, I wouldn't bet on any of it, but I will bet on this. I bet that the game is going to be fixed and that I don't know what the answer is going to be, but I am going to prove to you that it is going to be fixed by the end of this report. But let's look at last year's game, which a lot of people said was fixed because they had this big blowout between the good guy, Peyton Manning, and the bad guys being the Seattle, uh, what are they, the Seattle Seahawks. That's right. And now this year we have the Seahawks are kind of the good guys this year because they're the defending champions and the bad guys are the Patriots who are coming in off these scandals of, of videotaping people and deflating balls and other such nonsense. Look, I can tell you, the game is fixed and I'm going to prove it. But like I said, let's look at last year's. Uh, this is from ESPN.com. Fans bet a record $119 million on the Super Bowl. Gamblers wagered a record $119 million at Nevada casinos on the Super Bowl, allowing sports books to reap an unprecedented profit as the betting public lost out in Seattle's route of Peyton Manning-led Denver Broncos. And just what Vegas is reporting, they won out, the sports bookies, $19 million in profits in the action. Um, the last time a record was set like that was 2005, and it was $15.4 million. That's a lot of money, isn't it? But uh, Chris Chase writes, Seattle's Super Bowl win made gambling history. Experts estimate the legal gambling in Las Vegas accounts for 1% of all Super Bowl bets. By that metric, there was nearly $12 billion bet on the Super Bowl. Now we're talking some serious cash. $12 billion is a lot of money. It's more than the GDP of a lot of developing nations. So there is a lot at stake here by picking the winner or loser. And last year, Brian Tui, who we've had as a guest on the show many times, said he was getting email after email after email that the Broncos were going to win. This was their year. They were destined to win. Uh, like back in 2001 when the Patriots won, right after 9-11, the Patriots came through and Took it for everybody because we're all patriots, and if you are against the patriots, you're a total shill. Last year, Tui wrote, the fix is in. Can I use the term Super Bowl without the NFL suing me for some sort of copyright infringement? And he wrote, I have received somewhere around 100 emails from fans since the start of the playoffs. Every single email in my inbox said the same thing. The NFL is giving the Super Bowl to Peyton Manning. Good versus evil. Good being Manning and evil being the Legion of Boom. Well, we all saw what happened there. The Seattle Seahawks blew out the Denver Broncos, and you had... The bookies making record profits. What's going to happen this year? Now we've got the Patriots being built up as the bad guys. Can they come in and steal it from the Seahawks? What's the line right now? Well, let's look. The Denver Post reports that it's wavering. New England has been as good as a one-point favorite, and Seattle trails by as much as two points. The over-under is 47.5 to 48.5. So they're keeping it very close, so it's too hard to tell at this point where the fix is going to go. But here's something interesting. Super Bowl rookie ref tapped for the title game. This is out of Yahoo News. New York referee Bill Villanovich will be officiating his first Super Bowl when he leads a seven-man crew picked to work the NFL's title showcase, the league said on Tuesday. 
Bill Schuster, head linesman, Dana McKenzie, back judge, and Terrace Miles will be officiating the Super Bowl for the first time. So we have four first-timers working the Super Bowl. And as we've seen in the past, especially in the NBA, there have been instances where referees have gone to prison time for fixing games in these point-shaving scandals. Could this happen on a crucial call? It's a lot harder with all the instant replays and stuff, and you got to grease a lot of palms. But all it takes is one man to eventually uh, change the outcome of the game. So whoever's watching, are you going to be like this group of people at the bar? Are you going to be like this guy? You understand. You understand. Calm your butt down and yeah. listen, daggone game. So what, Green Bay lost? If you're rooting for one of these teams, it's going to be one or the other. But there's so much going on in the world. We might even be on the brink of World War III. We've got American commandos, it appears, running around the Ukraine. Stop, stop. On my face, on my face, please. I mean, the price of oil is dropping. What does that mean? That means our economy's tanking. Uh, IBM's laying off an unprecedented number of people. There is a global realignment going on. But what do most people care about? Who's going to win the Super Bowl? What are the commercials going to be? You people need to wake up and get out of it. Now, like I said, I, I told you I'm going to prove that there's a fix. Let's get into this next article from the fixesin.net. This is another Brian Tui article, The Unmentioned Consequences of the NFL's Recent Legal Battles. And he goes into a bunch of different court cases and how they were judged. But the real meat of this article is at the end under the Spygate lawsuit. There's a guy named Carl Mayer who was a New York Jets season ticket holder. And he tried to sue the NFL when it came out that the Patriots were videotaping the other team to learn their call signals. Well, what happened? The judge decided against Mayer and for the NFL. The judge wrote, at best, Mayer possessed nothing more than a contractual right to a seat from which to watch the NFL game between the Jets and the Patriots. And that right was clearly honored. It even says it on the back of the tickets. It says this, this ticket only grants entry into the stadium and a spectator seat for a specified NFL game. Thereby, Mayer suffered no causable injury to a legally protected right or interest. In fact, I have got last year's Super Bowl ticket. We sent Josh Owens and Jakari Jackson down there to see what all the hubbub was about. And on the back of this ticket, it says, this ticket is a revocable license and only grants entry into the stadium and a spectator seat for the specified national football game. Admission may be refused or withdrawn or the ticket holder ejected at the sole discretion of the NFL. Now, what does that actually mean? That means the NFL has no culpability if the game is fixed or not. It doesn't really matter. It's, it could be professional wrestling. It could be uh, determined years in advance. It could be determined a day in advance. It could be determined during halftime of the game. It doesn't matter. The NFL has no legal right to put on a fair contest. And it says it in English right here, and there's a lawsuit to back it up. So, my friends, I'm sorry to tell you, the Super Bowl is most likely fixed. That's right. So don't cry in your hot wings this Sunday when it doesn't go your way. And, you know, maybe take the time to learn about what's going on in the world and talk to your friends about it and educate your friends because... The world is a lot bigger than a football game, and it's definitely a lot more important. This has been Rob Dew for InfoWars.com and InfoWars Nightly News. If you like reports like these, please consider becoming a member of PrisonPlanet.tv. Your membership allows you to share your username and password with up to 20 people. That's 20 InfoWarriors for the price of one. So what are you doing? Get your membership today. Thank you for watching. <laughs> The knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year.
we have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. 2015 is almost here, and with it comes those New Year's resolutions to finally transform your body the way you want it. There's a reason over 88% of New Year's resolutions fail. Make this year different by equipping yourself with Oxy Powder, the next level in cleansing the body naturally. Using Super Oxygenation, Oxy Powder, available through InfoWarsLife.com, gently cleanses the body while you sleep with easy capsules. Tens of thousands of individuals have used Oxy Powder to cleanse their bodies and aid in their transformations. Even InfoWars Nightly News Director Rob Dew has been using Oxy Powder with incredible success. Took it that first day, and then I took it for six more days after that. 12 pounds melted off in about a week. I'd say a week, seven days. 2015 can be different. Diet and exercise are important, but a lot of us have already tried that. Oxy Powder flushes it out. Secure your Oxy Powder at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. And welcome back. Recently, we've heard President Obama say that he wants to make going through the first two years of college as seamless as finishing high school. But there's a problem with that. Somebody has to pay for this. And we'll talk about all that and so much more with our guest tonight, Callan Diggs. Thank you for joining us, Callan. Thank you, Jacquard, for having me. Okay, now you have a book here, Reaching the Finish Line. And it's my understanding that the book is coming out very soon. So tell us when the book is going to be released, where people can find it, and also what encouraged you to write the book. Absolutely. So the book right now is available in ebook format. Um, the, the official date for the paperback is May 5th um, this year. What inspired me to write the book, uh, Jakari, is I've helped 2,000 people reach the finish line in their careers uh, since the Great Recession. And a lot of people came from different situations. Some people lack the college degree or they lack the high school diploma. Or some people, they graduated out of college, but they want to change the degree, but they want to go back to school for it. So um, I wrote the book as a bridge to help people have direction, get them out of complacency, and help them reach the finish line. Right, and you're a young guy yourself. You're what, 28? I am, You're yes. the same age as me. So yeah. you, know, you get career advice from somebody who's actually in the field, and th that's something I wanna talk to you about. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'll tell you a little bit about my experience. You know, right. I was working, or I was going to school in Oklahoma. I was about 16 hours away from my degree, and then, you know, I, I sent some stuff into InfoWars, and Alex actually gives me a job. That was my experience, but that doesn't happen for everybody. You know, with the research you've done, what percentage of people actually get that dream job coming straight out of college? Well, it's quite interesting, um, Jakari, because three-fourths of Americans are not happy in their jobs. So that's 75% of the people that are stuck in their jobs. Perhaps they got to just do it to take care of their family, or they got to do it just to get by. So that's not typical. However, there are some strategies, and we will talk about today, how people can reach the finish line, depending on where they're coming from. Again, some people don't have a high school diploma, maybe because... You know, uh, for a single mom, she got pregnant, and now she has to take care of her kid. Another person, they may not uh, have a college degree because they can't afford it, or they just don't want to do it anymore. You know, so there's different situations that we could talk about. So let's just talk with that last one you're talking about. They don't have the finances, or they can't get the scholarships. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend to somebody? Absolutely. So there's several different programs. Um, so, for example, um, you know, there's race-based programs. So, for example, there's African-American scholarships or Hispanic scholarships that a person can apply for. Um, there's also scholarships that's provided if, uh, if you come from a, a, a certain um, income bracket. So if you're a lower income bracket, that can be provided for you. Uh, Minnesota has some programs like that. Oklahoma, um, state that you're from actually, has something called the Oklahoma Promise Program, which allows some free tuition um, for uh, uh, freshmen and sophomores who's getting started there. Right, and we hear all these, this talk about college graduates make X number of dollars more than somebody who doesn't graduate. Have you found that to be true? You know what, that's a good question, Jakari, because I get that a lot. and. The fact of the matter is, if it's a specialized career, there's no doubt that a college graduate is going to make more money. However, when we talk about non-specialized careers, like let's talk about the arts major. Okay. So the arts major is uh, people like photography, theater, music. Well, the average starting salary for an art major is $30,000 a year. 
Now, that's not a whole lot when you consider that most of these college graduates are going to have a lot of student loan debt. And they probably be spending decades and decades to pay that off. Mm -hmm. And then this is where um, a high school dropout or a college dropout can actually make more than these people who have degrees in arts. And nothing wrong with arts, but it's probably not the best bet you know, if you want to invest hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of dollars for college. And I find that a lot because I'll see people who didn't go to college or they just went to community college mm -hmm. and they have a very small amount of debt. Mm -hmm. First of my friends, they may have went to the big state school mm -hmm. and they spent that big state money and maybe they make more money on the job, but the person who didn't go to college or just has a high school diploma, they don't have a whole lot of debt. You know, they may work at, you know, Cracker Barrel, but they don't have the, the $70,000 in debt. Mm -hmm. So have you found that there's a medium debt for people who come out of a four-year or two-year degree program? Absolutely. Uh, it's about between thirty-five dollars and $40,000. So that's the typical debt that a college graduate is going to end up graduating with. Now, as you said, that definitely different. So a person go to Harvard or Penn State or right. one of these big universities, it's going to be a whole lot more. There's people that have eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 in student loan debt, and they're probably never going to pay it off. They're probably going to die with it, unfortunately. But there's definitely ways, as we talked about, that it could be avoided. You know, uh, for example, one way is for, uh, I always say that, a college uh, dropout or college, um, perhaps someone who's graduating or perhaps someone who's graduating from high school, they should consider doing a gap year. And what's great about a gap year is a gap year gives you contrast. And for, for someone who may be teaching English abroad, it may be a uh, volunteer at an orphanage abroad, maybe like in Costa Rica or something like that. But what it does is it exposes you to different cultures. It, it increases your skills and diversity. It also gives you good customer service skills. It also gives you good business experience skills. There's some studies that have shown that people who have studied or, or worked abroad and come back in the U.S. are actually more successful than people who have never done. And it also gives you an opportunity just to contrast that, as you were saying, you know, because some people, like I did, mm -hmm. they have that tunnel vision. You get out of high school, you go straight into college, which for me wasn't a bad experience. But then some guys, they look up and, you, like you said, they're $30,000, $40,000 in debt. So it also gives you a chance just to sit back and reflect and see, you know, is this really the best course of action for me? And you know what's powerful about that, Jakari, is that a lot of times what happens is, a, a student graduates from high school, they'll go to college and they'll say, you know what, I want to, I want to do computers. Mm -hmm. And then after two years, they won't do that anymore. And they change their major. And uh, now the trend is being that it actually takes six years to get your bachelor's as opposed to four years. Because a lot of times with high school graduates start college, they don't know what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So by doing that gap year, it allows them to be able to kind of get some contrast that we talked about. It allows them to really exercise different options on what may be a best fit for them, you know? Perhaps they can start the first two years of general education courses, and then by their sophomore year, they'll be more decided in which way they wanna go. Yeah, and I definitely experienced that as well because I went originally, I did some television production, and then I went to social sciences, uh, criminal justice, and eventually came back to the, uh, the television aspect of it, the uh, production aspect mm -hmm. of it. But a lot of people, like you said, they experience that thing. They mm -hmm. switch majors multiple times. You know, they go from this school to that school. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be beneficial to people to, you know, take the time just to reflect. And maybe, like you said, if you do go straight to college, maybe just take the general education courses, maybe take a few electives just to see what works out for you. Mm -hmm. But as far as the people, let's say they don't go to college. You know, I know in your book you talk about how to maybe switch a career without going through the college experience. Absolutely. And one way a person can do that by changing career successfully is by pivoting. And by pivoting, that is going from one industry to another industry. So one industry that you have knowledge and experience in and going to another industry. And in order to make it successful, you want to go from industries that are similarly related. So that way, it significantly reduces the learning curve. So one example could be a teacher. So a teacher um, is, going to deal with, is going to deal with kids and social services. They're going to deal with kids as well. And sometimes it could be kids of developmental disability. Sometimes it could be a kids that's underserved. So that could be a great transition from a teacher to become someone involved in social services without having to have a significant learning curve. Sure, they may take uh, maybe some CEU, which is continuing education units, to kind of to kind of catch up to speed. But at the same time, it's not going to be a 180. Right. And we talk about the experience because a lot of people, they come out of college, and I experienced this as well. You know, you have all the credits, mm -hmm. but they say, where is your actual experience? Where is your internships? Did you apprenticeship mm -hmm. somewhere? And a lot of people don't have that. And that's actually my experience because I went to school in Kansas. Mm -hmm. I got my two-year degree there. I was interning at a TV station, a small TV station. They gave me a job, you know, seven bucks an hour or whatever. I moved back to Oklahoma. And nobody wanted to give me a job. You know, mm -hmm. they said, you don't have the proper experience. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can elaborate on that point as 
people need to understand when they go through these degrees. It's not just the piece of paper, it's the experience that goes along with it that's actually going to get them the job. Absolutely. And I definitely recommend that a person do an internship. Some colleges, they kind of have it within their program. Other colleges, they don't even mention it. Mm -hmm. You know, so you graduate and you think you're highly qualified, got this shiny degree, and no one will give you no one will give you a chance because you don't have the experience. So when it comes to internships, there are several different options. Now, if you want to do something in the nonprofit sector in which you don't have to work for, you don't have to actually um, study nonprofits, but um, for example, if if let's say you get a degree in environmentalism. Mm -hmm. So what a person can do is they can go to a website like idealist.org and they can find paid internships about, about environmentalism. Now those internships are going to be not based on nonprofit organizations, but they could be great ways to get some experience that could supplement with your theoretic, with your theoretic academics. Now we talked about how to you know, get the better job if you have the employment, but what a lot of people are experiencing now is they get out of college and there's not even a job in their field. Mm -hmm. You know, their field is shrinking or, you know, the requirements go up and up. It used to be associate's degree, now it's a bachelor's degree, now it's a master's, and then eventually a doctorate. You know, I know people, they need to have a bachelor's degree just to have internship running coffee and running the fax machine. So how does somebody combat this unemployment uh, system? Absolutely. So uh, internships is one. Um, and, and, to be, and what's funny is there's actually some paid internships that actually pay more than entry-level jobs. Uh, Google is an example. A lot of people are, 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 are trying to always apply for Google, in, Google internships because they're one of the most high-paying, and they tend to pay more than a lot of entry-level jobs. So that's just one. Another one is volunteering. So if you're living with your parents and you really don't have no responsibility and you really have no bills, well, that could be a good option as well. You could volunteer for, let's say, a nonprofit organization for maybe about a summer, maybe several months to get that experience. And then by the end of that term, they may actually give you a position to work for their company. So that's another one. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different ones. We talk about apprenticeships. Apprenticeships is another one to be able to. Now, this is like if you're doing like blue collar work. So if you're doing something like you're like an electrician, if you're like a plumber or you're something like that, which actually those jobs are still in demand. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, Definitely. They're, they're, no, no one wants to do them, but they're still in demand. They actually pay well. So you could, you, you could do your apprenticeship for a year, and then once you get your license or your certification, you become a journeyman, and then you can work by yourself and kind of have your own career. Yeah, and I'm glad you touched on that, talking about the, uh, the plumbers, uh, the other type of trades, mm -hmm. or even people who make uh, drive garbage trucks. I understand those guys make a decent amount of they money. Do. And w when I was in Oklahoma, I knew a guy. He worked at one of the local casinos as, uh, what do you call those guys, the valet. Uh-huh. And those guys made more in tips than the managers did working at the casino. For sure. So, you know, that's another aspect that a lot of people, they don't really quite understand, a lot of the young people. And I mean, I'll tell anybody to the face, uh, the young people, they ask me about school or whatever else. And I say, well, you know, take the time to really sit back and reflect on this. Ask somebody who's telling you to go to college, mm -hmm. ask them what their student loan debt is. Mm -hmm. And if they don't want to tell you that, then take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. Because I'll, I'll tell them straight up, man, I, I left school with about $6,000 and student loan debt. And most people don't have that. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people telling them to go to the big state schools and spend all this big money, they're still paying on their student uh -huh. loan debt. So, you know, you take all this stuff into consideration. But I, I know we talked a lot about that. I know you also have some articles, and I want to talk about those articles. Absolutely. We can pull those up. Great. So we have an article here um, by Susan Adams, and it's from Forbes, and it's the bad news behind the unemployment numbers. And if we look at the article, 31% of Americans who have looked for jobs in the past four weeks have been unemployed for six months or more. Just imagine that. A lot of people think, oh, but unemployment rate is 5.8%, which is completely a fraud because whether, whether you're working 40 hours a week, 14 hours a week, or four hours a week, the government still considers you unemployed, which is not an accurate reflection because that's not a living that people can sustain themselves on. I'm so glad you said that because a lot of people, they look at all these, uh, these statistics, and then even the job creation that we do see, a lot of that's in the government sector. But you, as you said, it's a fraud. It's very misleading data. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk more about this. Let's talk about briefly, uh, a lot of people that are on part-time status now because, you know, mm -hmm. Obamacare, things like that. We saw Walmart saying that we can't afford to pay people, you know, the normal wage because of Obamacare. Mm -hmm. So even people who are able to get a job there, they're working part-time with fewer, if any, benefits. So now they have to work multiple jobs mm -hmm. just to get that same paycheck that they used to get uh, years before. So that's a great point that you brought up, Jakari because um, there's ways that there's alternatives to unemployment. A person can be self-employed. So a lot of times people may get the hours cut back and have to be part-time. Well, there's one way a person can actually get multiple part-times and actually develop a full-time income. So one way is, for example, there's something called event promotions. And where a company like AT&T 
they, they would need, they need like a back to school campaign. And usually they don't execute these kind of campaigns. They'll hire a marketing firm to do the campaign. And usually what happens is a marketing firm is gonna look for someone like you to do the campaign. So they subcontract that assignment for you to do it. And a lot of these signs pay anywhere between $16 to $25 an hour. Now, of course, you can't stand you living off of one assignment, but if you get multiple assignments, that could be a very lucrative living. So that's one way to combat off getting laid off and going from full-time to part-time. You can find some of those event promotions, you know, gather those up, and I can help you out a little bit. Okay, now with the time we have, let's talk about the book. Mm -hmm. So people can pick up the book where? At reachingthefinishline.com. Okay, reachingthefinishline.com. And if they also go to the website, they can also get my free white paper, save up to 75%, what the IRS doesn't want you to know. A lot of people are getting into small business, you know, but they end up paying, you know, we, we see how small business is getting hurt by Obamacare, a lot of these other laws. Well, there's a way that the IRS don't openly tell people about that people can actually save up to 75%. And that's something they get my free white paper at reachingthefinishline.com. Okay, so tell us, um if somebody picked this book up, mm -hmm. you know, do you suggest they read it from the beginning? But like, what's the most powerful chapter in here? If, let's say, you know, the young person who's about to go to college, you mm -hmm. know, they're 18, they just graduated, uh, they're about to go to the community college. What chapter should they read? There's actually Jukari, a chapter in there that talks about how to graduate with a bachelor's degree in one year. Now, we talked about how a lot of these college students are end up graduating with a bachelor's degree in six years instead mm -hmm. of four years because they keep changing their major. Well, you, you can actually do it in one year. And one way to do it in one year is do something called credit by examination. And basically what they are is instead of spending three months or a whole semester in college, you could take a simple test. Basically you could test out of these subjects. Oh. So you test out your subjects, you get a grade, and you go to the next subject. And if a person could basically take a bunch of tests, if they're a good test taker, they can basically get a bachelor's degree in one year. Now those majors are not vast, they're, mm -hmm. they're quite limited. So it's gonna be liberal arts, it's gonna be business administration, criminal justice, things like that. But if a person just want a college degree, want to get, get it done and over with, it could be a very effective way in doing it. And as well, it's very affordable. Each test is about $85. So just take the $85 times whatever amount of courses, that's going to be a whole lot less than what you're going to pay for of a bachelor's degree. And Jakari, for your listeners, what I want to do is, if they send me an email at Callen, which is K-A-L-L-E-N, at reachingthefinishline.com, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to give them a free copy of this ebook. Free copy, not the physical book, but I'll be happy to send you a copy of the free ebook of Reaching the Finish Line. You can send me an email at callen at reachingthefinishline.com. But if you want the paper back, you can go to reachingthefinishline.com. All right, Callen, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Jakari. All right. Well, that's it for our show tonight. Be sure to stop by prisonplanet.tv and get a subscription. You can see the nightly news, the special reports, the rants, all that on prisonplanet.tv. I'm Jakari Jackson for the InfoWars Nightly News, and we'll see you again tomorrow night. City of Austin tap water versus filtered City of Austin tap water. I can like taste dirt in it. God knows what's in this. This has an aftertaste. Tastes like Austin water? Yeah, it does. Ugh. These people just sampled City of Austin tap water straight from the faucet. Next, we had them try a sample of tap water filtered through the ProPure G2.0 filtration system. High quality H2O. That one is better. Tastes like nothing. Yep, I know what good water tastes like. It's good water. Most tap water contains added substances like fluoride, chlorine, Monsanto's deadly pesticide, glyphosate, and many others. Studies prove that these substances are linked to an assortment of major health issues, including tooth decay, lowered IQ, and even cancer. It tastes like you're drinking out of the lake when you're drinking tap water. Yeah, it has uh, that uh, processed flavor to it. The ProPure G2.0 filtration system removes these deadly substances and many more, leaving only fresh tasting, deliciously clean water. Okay, this is very tasty. It's good water. Refreshing. It's good. <laughs> Go to InfoWarsStore.com today. Use promo code WATER and save 10% off your ProPure purchase. Again, that's InfoWarsStore.com or call 1-888-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.